back a year ago. Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. We are excited to be joined by Raul Masenke from Elias Wicked Ales and Spirits. This craft brewery and pub can be found in the Quezon City suburbs, just northeast of the colossal city of Manila in the Philippines. Elias is known for producing high quality craft beers, hard ciders, and hard seltzers while incorporating sugars from local fruits, such as mangoes, dalandan, guava, and guayabano. Elias came to be when owner and certified beer sommelier Raul Masenke brought home the wealth of knowledge of the art and science of fermented drinks that he developed in the United States, as well as his award-winning craft beer recipes back home to Manila. So we're super excited to be joined by Raul, welcome, Raul, to the Beer Bam, Beer Bound Podcast. How are you, sir? Hi, Andy. Hi, Garrett. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me and inviting welcome. me to your podcast. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, Raul, maybe you can start us off. We gave a little introduction, but can you talk a little bit more about yourself? You're not joining us from the Philippines. You're in the United States currently. So, yeah, just give us a little bit of background on you, how you got into beer, craft beer, Spirits, what's your story? Yeah, sure. So, um, Elias Wicked Ales and Spirits is a uh, microbrewery uh, we're based in uh, Manila, uh, where the Quezon City is very close to Manila. And um, we have a 10 barrel system there. Uh, we have a pilot system of two barrels. Are you in barrels or in uh, liters? <laughs> For more liters in Canada, oh, more liters in the, Canada. The typical <laughs> jargon goes by for the most part barrels, I think, even in even in Canada. So. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So ten <laughs> hectoliters, basically. Uh, so we're we're doing uh, uh, as you mentioned, craft beers, hard ciders, and uh, hard seltzers. So we started. Uh, I, I founded it uh, four years ago. We just actually had our fourth year anniversary last week, and um, I was there. Uh, but uh, I, I live in Virginia, so I'm based in Virginia, and um, I'm just lucky to have uh, my guys working for me there. Uh, when I started this uh, brewery, I went back to the Philippines. I quit my job. I, I was there for two and a half years um, to establish it and train my staff. And now that they can uh, do it on their own, I don't have to be there. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I went back to the, to the U.S., so... Uh, I'm working full time here as an engineer. Oh, you're a busy guy. Um, Raul, maybe can you go back a little bit more into your history with beer, sort of how you transitioned living in the Philippines, living in the United States, just a bit more background on how you really got started and got into the industry. Okay. Yeah. So I started, uh, I've been home brewing for nine years. I, I really fell in love with craft beers. I remember my first Craft beer was Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. It mm -hmm. uh, blew my mind. Uh, I've been uh, a beer lover, but uh, in the Philippines, it's just hard to get uh, all craft beers or other beers aside from San Miguel, which is 99% uh, uh, in dominating the market uh, mostly. So um, I work in Singapore for a few years. Uh, my company moved me there and I was uh, introduced to several craft beers, uh, American craft beers. Uh, Happy beers, I think um, I fell in love with it. And um, the company moved me to the US and um, that's where I started home brewing. So I home brewed, home brewed for maybe four years and uh, I've decided, hey, maybe I, I wanna open a brewery in the Philippines and introduce something that I enjoy doing. So that's why um, I moved back and opened the brewery. And you mentioned you're in, you work in engineering or you are an engineer, is that, um, a chemical engineer by any chance? No, no. Uh, yeah, it's an electronics engineer. I am an electronics engineer. I work in the semiconductor company. Hmm. Uh, but, but, but also I, I work in the laboratory, so I have some chemical background doing failure analysis. So I think uh, that helped too. I think that's what, also one of the reasons why I fell in love with craft beers because uh, I, I, before this uh, interview, I was thinking, hey, what, what got me into craft beers? And 
I think it's because uh, it's an engineering that I can taste, you know, it's a result of good engineering. Um, a lot of things are going on, even brewery installations. Uh, we're talking about mechanical engineering, we're talking about chemical engineering. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of engineering that's, that's happening. At the well, Rao, can I be rude and ask, uh, how, how old are you? <laughs> I am, uh, yeah, I am 38, 38. 38, okay. Yeah. You, you look younger than that even, but even 38, <laughs> it's very, very young to be like working full time and you own a massive enterprise all the way on the other side of the world. Do you get any sleep at all? Are you just a, a workaholic? How do, you, how do you manage that? Well, it's the cider that makes me look young. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I don't know. I just uh, like... Uh, uh, learning new things i think um i uh, i like it when i'm busy mm -hmm. and uh yeah uh, fulfilling some some things <laughs> fair enough right. busy yeah. days are good days That's yeah it is <laughs> garrett and i like to say make hay when the sun shines <laughs> yeah it's an expression or when it doesn't <laughs> or when it doesn't make yeah. hay every day well i know that garrett and i garrett and i are not brewers by trade we're associated with the industry in alternate ways but we are connected to a lot of craft brewers and brewery owners and we know just how much effort and how much work it is and it it really is often a passion project <laughs> that you just pour all of your time and love and dedication to can i ask what that's like you were in the philippines i think you mentioned when the brewery opened but now you're running it from, again, from across the Pacific Ocean. Do you, <laughs> how do you manage that? Is that, do you have, do you have a lot of say and a lot of contact with the brewery or do you have most of the management and the administration already set up and, and you, you're just sort of the owner and that's kind of it? How does it work? Yeah, it's actually uh, hard uh, managing it from here. I still do the daily operations, the day-to-day -day operations. I talk to my uh, staff every day. <laughs> the good thing is it's a different time zone, so I, I have a day job and at night I, I talk to them. Um, right. So that's that's really good. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, we put a lot of systems in place just to make sure that we're hitting the right targets and I think uh, another thing that, that helped me is I was able to step back and uh, focus on the strategic side of things. Uh, it's very easy for you to be involved with the operations when you're there as an owner, right? Like a lot of things, something small things happen and you think that you can do it on your own. Uh, but uh, when I started to manage it from here, I was able to delegate some things and I was able to find uh, solutions that it doesn't involve that me being there actually so i was able to get like you know people to work for us uh, i was able to to hire some yeah some some suppliers that can help us on some some things instead of us really doing everything so yeah but still challenging uh, i think i'm i'm just lucky that i was able to hire good people i'm very happy with the team i talk to them and i visit them uh, once in a while uh, to, just to make sure that uh, yeah, everything is uh, working as That's expected. The importance of a good team, right? Um, yeah. And I feel like that goes a long way, especially with craft beer being, you know, we like to, we like to think craft beer is very synonymous with community. And then, you know, if you have someone who, who finds the same passion as you, and it, it kind of sounds like you have, especially the fact that, you know, you are quite far away, but you can delegate those those activities to, to your staff. Um, I guess maybe in that light, you know, when, when you say, you know, you've hired some good people and, and you, you delegate a lot. What are some of those things you look for when, you know, accepting someone into your, your enterprise, right? This is your craft brewery and you, you created from the, down, the ground up. Is there something maybe that you look for when, when looking to have someone join your team? Uh, that's a good question, Garrett. Actually, I, I, uh, I'm looking for people that are, are you know, as I maybe hardworking, uh, really willing to learn. Uh, I don't think I can find expertise in the Philippines about craft brewing. Uh, that's, the, that's the main, uh, I mean, there's no brewmaster there, cannot hire people that, that's really involved in the industry. So I just look for people that are willing to work hard and uh, willing to learn. 
and I'm giving them opportunities. So uh, this is a new industry in the Philippines and it's, it's really hard because we have to train them from ground up. Uh, they, they haven't touched, you know, kegs, they haven't touched faucets, uh, you know, maybe some bars, uh, some bartender uh, selling San Miguel, but that's it. Mm -hmm. They haven't, you know, um, especially the brewing side is something that um, very manual um, and a lot of trainings are involved mm -hmm. yeah. and safety. <laughs> yeah, that's big. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the biggest part, actually. Uh, so that's uh, the discipline. I, I look for people that are uh, disciplined as well because uh, you cannot, um, yeah, brewing, brewing operations uh, involves a lot of risk and mm -hmm. hazard. So. For sure. A lot of slippery wet floors at, at times, I'm sure. But that's yeah. great. Oh, I'm happy that, that, you know, you found that, you know, you, you found your people to help you and sort of create and, or continue that dream. So you mentioned, you let, you know, craft beer um, in the Philippines is, is sort of new right um or, or at least just sort of taking off so is there any maybe specific trends like do you find that there's a, a um maybe a learning curve for those your, your patrons coming in to, to get them to try some of the things and, and how do you approach that yeah that's uh uh we're, we're uh uh most of uh, filipinos uh, enjoy lagers because mm -hmm. of san miguel uh, commercial brands uh heineken came into last uh, few years and uh, it's been hard for us to uh, introduce uh, craft beer, especially bitter beers like IPAs. Um, uh, I think uh, there's a small community that uh, of um, enthusiasts that are really trying to promote craft beers. And um, I think right now, last few months, we've, the tap room has been busy. And... Um, we're getting a lot of people that are um, re really interested to trying new new uh, beers, new styles. Uh, we're selling a lot on our uh, IPAs, actually. Mm. I think it's uh, either, uh, it's it's the customers that are going to the brewery that really like to drink craft beers, I think. Right. Because IPAs, uh, if you go to a brewery, uh, like me, if I go to a brewery, I always try the IPAs and see if, you know, uh, the brewery is making a good one because uh, it's like a benchmark of craft beer. Uh, of uh, so, but but we've introduced uh, hard ciders and hard seltzers. Hard seltzers, uh, we um, introduced them last December, and it's really doing well. I think mm. people are are uh, still looking for light flavors, especially the the girls. Uh, they don't like something bitter. They don't like uh, something roasty. And uh, they want to stick to something that they're familiar with, like fruits. Uh, a lot of met them are, are ordering, like you know, the mango, the, the landan, uh, those uh, mm. those flavors that they're already familiar with. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah seltzers have. Wow, well, it's, <laughs> it's interesting that you say that because like hard seltzers have been well very popular as of late, but I feel like they're they're more so maybe dying down here, at least in in, in southern Ontario and and, and, be, and from who we've spoken to in North America as well. Uh, last summer was the summer of seltzers as as we saw it anyways, but you know they were great, they're refreshing, they're wonderful on a warm day, which I imagine there's plenty of warm days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's nice to see that you know those even even if it's a, a trend somewhere else that it still has its place and it's fitting and, and it has that demand elsewhere. And yeah, they're great. I saw seltzers are, are fantastic. Like you know, like you said, very refreshing, very uh, and, and having seltzers as well as like you're saying IPAs. We're always a big fan of options, so having having yeah. a number of options is always great. Yeah, I think that's the strength of the tap room right now. We have several uh, beers that we, uh, we have 30 taps and uh, at least 20 of them. Uh, we have like five hired ciders and then we have seven or eight hard uh, craft beers and then a few uh, seltzers. We even have a slushy machine with the uh, seltzer. Oh. So oh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, refreshing, uh, they like it. So I think that's the strength of the tap room right now. Uh, we have several uh, flavors available. Raul, do you do you have any other like experience in starting an entrepreneurial venture, or is this sort of your first the first business that you've created? Yeah, when I was in Singapore, I I got into DJing and uh, I started to sell some DJ equipment back to the Philippines. I always trying to look for something that we don't have back home. <laughs> I guess I started with that and. Um, it was okay, but uh, I think um, um, 
I got uh, more interested with the craft beers than, than music. And um, I think it's more sustainable, actually. So, yeah, so I, 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 I um, focus more on that. Yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm still a learning entrepreneur, um, especially we just opened um, uh, four years ago. And uh, I mean, minus two years that are that's during pandemic. So un until now, I mean, I can say I'm still learning a lot, uh, a lot of back office, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Raul, can you expand a little bit, just maybe go way back to, to growing up in the Philippines, like how that shaped you? Maybe just for our viewers who maybe don't know too much. I, I visited the Philippines once. I had such oh, an amazing wow. experience. Yeah, I spent a, only a couple of days in Manila, but it was, okay. it was a really, That's awesome. yeah, it was an amazing experience. The city is just gigantic and people were very warm and friendly and the food was fantastic. It, it was great. Maybe, can you can you tell us your opinion on this enormous Asian city and your thoughts of the Philippines in general? It can be related to beer or just sort of your connection with, with the country that you're from. Yeah, sure. Uh, I grew up in uh, Manila. I mean, uh, Pasig City uh, within the metropolitan Manila. And um, well, it's uh, very populated. I studied there until college and then uh, so I moved here for just work. But um, uh, so I can say Philippines has a very um, strong F&B industry, food and beverage industry. We have uh, so many good restaurants. Um, for the beverage side, we have, uh, well, San Miguel is really, really strong. Everyone loves San Miguel. I think that's the hardest or the most challenging for craft brewers because everybody just likes San Miguel because we grew up with San Miguel. So, and it's a good beer. I remember drinking San Miguel, posting selfies on, you know, uh, the, the beer that I'm drinking. You won't see that in maybe some other brands that you, they post with a commercial brand. But Filipinos really uh, uh, embrace San Miguel as a brand. Um, yeah, I think um, Filipinos were a beer drinking country. Uh, we like beers. Uh, we like to gather and socialize. And uh, what I notice is um, we also like to eat. Uh, during gatherings, so we we buy beer and it we always need to have food on the table and for us to share. So and that's the reason why I, in our tap room we are also selling food and we have a small kitchen there and it helps a lot too. Um, we like music, we like karaoke, <laughs> we like uh, yeah, we like. Um, I think uh, also our our drinking hours is after dinner. So that's very much, uh, maybe it's an Asian thing. Uh, we go home first, uh, we, we eat dinner, we take a shower, and then we go out to, to drink or party. And um, that's something that uh, I know this, of course, in the Western, West, Western now, we, we drink uh, even at noon time, so lunchtime, <laughs> start drinking and watch sports. So yeah, very much a uh, different um, drinking scene. Yeah. Do you know why San Miguel, like you're right. It's if you, if anyone's been to the Philippines, it's like, it's one of almost your national symbols. You just see that this beer brand everywhere. Is that true? You said it's like 99% like of the, they have that much of the market share in the Philippines. It is. It is that, actually, that, yeah, the, actually that they're very successful that they're also exporting uh, to a lot of Asian countries and for sure, even in the U S but Hong Kong, I heard they're drinking a lot of San Miguel's there some other Asian countries. But in the Philippines, they just dominate the market. Uh, mm -hmm. Heineken came in. Uh, they were very strong with marketing, but uh, during pandemic, they closed down. So, wow. I mean, they, they were contract brewing to uh, another facility, but they stopped the contract brew mm -hmm. after, during pandemic. So it just shows that San Miguel just dominates the market. Mm -hmm. It's just hard for them to penetrate. Uh, do you think that's to do with like it just it's a lovely beverage to go with the hot the hot climate that you have like it just it's a really refreshing lager do you think that's the basic reason do you know this the story behind it i really don't know too much of the brand but maybe yeah. you can share any information you have yeah i think um that that's true it's a uh, very easy to uh, to drink um they have san miguel light which is like you know miller light maybe and uh, people like to drink it really, really cold. Uh, I think uh, it goes with the weather. And they have a good uh, branding. They have like 
the 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 uh, marketing is just crazy. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, also, the their distribution network. Uh, they the, the one of the challenges that we have in the Philippines is uh, we're a group of islands, and if you don't have a good distribution network, then it will be hard for you to penetrate those other islands. Philippines itself is like far from other Asian countries. Going to the Philippines in Manila and going from Manila to other cities, you have to fly again. So I think San Miguel was able to uh, take care of the distribution. And even if you go to provinces, you will see San Miguel there. Everywhere you will, you will see them. And I think it's 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 uh, it was hard for other brands uh, to penetrate that. So they already have a good uh, footprint on those. I could be totally wrong. Aren't there like 6,000 islands? Isn't that right? Yeah, uh, 7,000 islands. 7,000. 7, wow. <laughs> yeah. So how do you, how do you even, how, how is that a country? How can you even, how, how can you regulate shipping and manage logistics if you have so many, so many different islands spread out? I mean, particularly if you're a massive company like San Miguel, I mean, it might be easier. But in terms of your brewery, Elias is... Do you distribute at all, or are you mostly centered in your facility? How how expansive is your brand? Yeah, so it's um, we haven't touched a lot of them. We only uh, we have some customers that orders from us, let's say in Cebu or some other uh, areas, and uh, we try to ship to them. Uh, but uh, our our focus right now is in Manila. But uh, we are opening another location, another tap room in Bohol, which is in, uh, in an island uh, where it's known for fine, fine uh, sand. And um, there's a really good tourist. Um, uh, a lot of tourists are going there. So it's a, it's a, it's a local attraction, basically. So uh, we're trying to open one there. And even right now, if you ask me about logistics, uh, I have to still figure it out but uh, <laughs> I have, there are some uh, shipping companies uh, we've shipped through air freight or sea freight and it's just take, takes a while i'm interested in basically in in who your main clientele is we we had a podcast a few or maybe just a week ago with pasture street brewing it's a, a brewery oh yeah yeah Do you know that in, it's, now. Yeah. in saigon yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. And I asked them who your main clientele is. It is it mostly international folks, and and they said, well, to start it was, but but really, they've been really impressed and surprised with how the local, how the Vietnamese population has started to embrace IPAs and different sort of American craft beer styles. Are you seeing that more and more? I mean, I know Manila is an extremely international city as well. So you have you have a lot of ex, expats there and they probably enjoy coming, say Americans or whoever to, to come enjoy some craft beer. But are you seeing a lot of locals as well interested in these American styles or, or is it mostly you're attracting the, the expat community? Yeah, uh, we are also getting locals uh, to drink our products. And uh, I think uh, most of them are well-traveled, that they've tried craft beer somewhere. I think that's a good thing. It's very popular in the US and you know, in Canada and, uh, and in Europe. So we have some guests that have traveled and uh, oh, uh, we can get the local craft, uh, you know, there's a local craft, craft beer now. So mm -hmm. they're happy that we are, selling those. Uh, we have some expats that are visiting our tap room. Uh, I think uh, it's good to have like Untapped and uh, other social media that we always uh, post and it's really helping us spread the word that uh, there's a brewery in Manila. Uh, I think um, I can say majority are locals. Yeah, They're, they're starting to embrace the, the craft beers with the, with the ciders, uh, hard seltzers and uh, IPAs, uh, but IPA drinkers are, they drink a, a small community, but they drink a lot, I can say. So, <laughs> so craft beer enthusiasts, but they, they can finish a lot of beers uh, in one sitting. So I think that, that's our market as well. Certainly relate to that. <laughs> and I are definitely hop heads yourselves. So, you know, when you exactly. have one IPA, you definitely want another one, another after that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I like that you have hard cider. So like, you know, there's, there's usually when, 
I go to different craft breweries and breweries that we speak with, you know, you have a wide variety of different craft beers. And I, I know you've already mentioned that you have seltzers. So why did you go the hard cider route? Like, you know, maybe you could have gone some other uh, a type of beverage, but why the hard cider specifically? Uh, when, when we started four years ago, uh, I was still waiting for our brewery equipment and uh, I want to do something. So, okay, maybe I can start with hard cider. So I, that's where I, it started actually. But I've been doing hard ciders even in the US. I didn't know that it would be uh, something that we will be offering in a regular basis or at least uh, will be known for. So I did some hard ciders. Um, we don't have orchards in the Philippines, so I have to look for uh, extracts. And um, from there, uh, we started with the local fruits. It was challenging using, you know, local ingredients, uh, let's say mango. And um, uh, as we are growing, then we're, uh, we're working on our supply chain on the, the ciders. And we were able to, to get uh, them in bulk and we were able to lower the price. So, yeah. That's, that's, that's one of the challenges in the, uh, in the Philippines, uh, the ingredients availability. Right. And um, if you stick to, let's say, craft beer and we, we run out of malts, then uh, we cannot anymore make some craft beers. At least uh, if mm -hmm. I have a, a three, three products range, uh, uh, we can still make hard ciders. And right now we are doing seltzers, which is uh, we have local sugar. So... Uh, that's that's the reason why we go to seltzers because that's the only product that we can make locally uh, mm -hmm. with the local ingredients and the, except for the yeast of course uh, the yeast is something to uh, have to bring in. Oh, that's cool and uh, yeah, utilizing local ingredients for you know products that you can use but like that you know just almost out of fate okay I'll try making ciders while waiting for my equipment and then <laughs> you know you made a, a wonderful product and you're able to utilize that and, and make it part of your business line I think that's that's definitely great. So like you're yeah. saying with regards to, you know, the ingredients for craft beer, um, you know, um, and if there is a scarcity, I'm, I'm sure, you know, obviously with logistic problems over the last geez now from the last two years, give or take, um, you know, how are some ways you get around that? Like if you do uh, run out, it, you know, do you try and source from a different location? Like I can't imagine where you might get your hops. I'm uh, sorry, your malt from, but I, you know, I, I know you are fairly close to Australia and New Zealand who do are pretty big hop providers. However, we, we spoke with someone very recently who has a brewery in, in uh, Australia and they said even getting their own hops was yeah. very difficult. So like, you know, is that, I'm, I imagine that might pose a challenge for you. Yes, that's true. So getting the ingredients is the most challenging part in opening a brewery hmm. actually. So everything is imported. And uh, actually, I'm here in Craft Brewers Conference in Minnesota because I'm looking for suppliers. And mm -hmm. um, so we have some distributors in the Philippines for, for malts and hops, but uh, they also ran out. Uh, it was tough during pandemic. I think they haven't fixed their supply issues yet. And um, the industry is so small that uh, sometimes uh, they, uh, they have... Uh, sacks of malts that expire if they bring in a lot. So they have to balance, uh, you know, the, the, the demand and the supply that they're bringing. I hope uh, we will be able to fix that. So right now we are planning to expand, but we want to fix the, the supply, supply uh, of ingredients. So we want to bring in our own malts, our own hops. Uh, we're bringing in, bringing, bringing in our yeast as well. I think uh, those are critical. And um, yeah, uh, hops from New Zealand and Australia, it's hard for us to get those as well. Uh, I think their uh, contract, uh, they already have a contract from the big brands. Uh, they go straight to straight to a US, maybe they pay more <laughs> premium uh, for those. Uh, the hops right. that we get, in, we, get we, we get in the Philippines are probably not the 2021 20, 20, hops. I, I, mm -hmm. It's probably a little bit, uh, you know, older. Uh, the varieties that we have uh, are, you know, the typical Cascades, uh, Simcoe, Citra, Sea Hops, and it's hard for us to get uh, some new varieties. So, yeah, that's something that I think uh, the reason I'm in the in the I'm in the U.S. as well is uh, I was able to to get some ingredients here and send it back. I was able to get some more knowledge about commercial beers, and it's helping the team as well there. So I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, 
it's good that uh, I was able to get some here. It's really hard. hard. Raul, do you know the number of other breweries that exist maybe in greater Manila or maybe in the, the Philippines entirely? Do you know how many exist? I think uh, we had the Southeast Asia Brew Conference to, last 2019. And during that time, we had 80 breweries. 80 breweries, but uh, I can say that maybe 20 of them are the ones that are invested with a brewing capacity of two hectoliters and above. So we have small brewery brands in the Philippines. Uh, home brewers are also uh, posting and selling their beers publicly. Um, I think uh, we don't really have a strict regulation about it uh, compared to the other countries that you cannot sell, you know, if you're not registered or uh, as a home brewer. So, and that's uh, the reason why we have 60 or 70 brands uh, that are selling uh, beers. But for those that are with the capacity and invested in the equipment, I think uh, around 20. Okay. 20, yeah. And you mentioned regulation. So it's not, the regulation isn't too high in the Philippines. Would you say, was it relatively easy in terms of the bureaucracy that you went through in order to open your doors? Or would you say it's it's comparable to, to opening something in the US? Is it easier? Are there other complications that, that would arise that wouldn't occur in, in the U.S. What was that experience like? Yeah, I think it's uh, easy to open one in the Philippines right now. Well, it depends. If you want to sell your beers in the market, like in cans and bottles, you need to get FDA certification. Uh, you need that. That one is the juice. It may take uh, one year, uh, one and a half years, and every product needs to be registered. So for us, uh, we're still waiting for our product registration. We're already FDA approved facility. After the facility has been approved, you have to submit a registration for actual cans. Uh, that's the hardest part. Uh, but if you just want to sell beers online or you want to open a tap room, I think it's not that uh, hard as compared to opening one in the US. So yeah, it's actually easy, easier to sell uh, new 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 flavors in the U.S. because you only need to get the label approved, uh, the TTB label approved, and that's why a lot of breweries are just selling new cans every week, new products every week. So because TTB label is uh, uh, fast uh, in the Philippines, uh, if you, I want to register one product, I have to wait for at least six months if I want to sell it in the market, like in the grocery stores. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, but if you're a small brewery and you want to sell it online, I think no one really you know, no one gets about it. an eyelash, I suppose. Yeah, yeah the rules yeah. are relaxed. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's not legal, but <laughs> you can get away with it. <laughs> mm. So a gray area, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, it, it is <laughs> interesting. And what about shipping internationally? I, I suspect it would be expensive, but legally and. Um, how feasible would it be to, to ship your product to, to Hong Kong or Vietnam or maybe the United States? I don't know. Would that be yeah. even possible? I know maybe your maybe your capacity right now is still not not quite prepared for that yet. But do you know any yeah. any information on international shipping? I haven't I haven't checked a lot on that. Uh, but yes, I think you just have to register your product. Yeah, right now right now we're uh, on uh, out of capacity actually. So we're hopefully uh, we can uh, have more capacity yeah we started with two barrel and now we're in 10 barrel and it feels like oh man uh, we need more so <laughs> it's, good problem uh, to have <laughs> yeah yeah i hope i hope it stays the same um i hope it's not like uh, because only last three months that people are going out and drinking and for the last three months data it looks like oh man we're running out so we have to but hopefully it stays like that uh, more people are, uh, you know, interested to try craft beers now. Maybe they've seen it on social media. We were we were doing that during pandemic, uh, mm. but uh, yeah. So I have this idea too to maybe bring my brand outside the Philippines. But I might just be doing contract brewing. Let's say, I think it's more um, feasible because um, even right now the ingredients are really hard. Uh, what if I can just you know brew in Australia? They have the ingredients there. Maybe in the US. Uh, yeah. I don't have to deal with uh, a lot of, uh, you know, ingredients. Um, maybe it's easier and more uh, equipment or capacity and skills to do it too. So. 
Raul, this may be a stupid question, but I'm going to go for it anyway. I know like lots of different countries all over the world that have different perceptions about alcohol, even in the United States. It, it depends on where you are. Some places are more, some states are more liberal than others. You have dry communities. You have some religious communities that maybe look down on alcoholic consumption or or prefer, I guess they dissuade individuals from drinking maybe with dry laws or something. Would you say my experience in the Philippines was that you're, it's a pretty open culture in terms of drinking? Like, I don't know. I don't know if overconsumption of alcohol is a problem necessarily, but, but it seems like, I mean, you see San Miguel everywhere. So yeah, partic exactly. particularly beer seems to be kind of a very normal product and, and a normal beverage that everyone seems to drink. Do you think that, I mean, I know the Philippines is it's a very, still a very religious country. So I don't know, is there, is there any, do you see any like pushback a little bit in terms of just being in the, I mean, in the food and beverage industry, but particularly in the alcoholic sector, do you see any, is there some challenges there? Is the country, particularly Manila and the area surrounding the city, is it pretty relaxed to alcohol or, or do you see some restrictions or some cultural disagreements? Yeah, it's a pretty relaxed. I think uh, most people uh, enjoy. Yeah, they they like to drink. Uh, uh, it's uh, we we like to socialize, and every time we socialize, we always you know get something. That we drink, we talk, and uh, we eat. So I think um, it's it's pretty normal. I I think in the Mindanao or southern part of the Philippines, uh, there are Muslims that they don't drink. I think uh, the so far we haven't. You know, we haven't been to those uh, places. Uh, our peers are still in Metro Manila, which uh, a lot of people are are used to uh, maybe binge drinking San Miguel. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think uh, we don't have any uh, problem. Well, they'll soon be drinking, binge drinking Elias, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah, that, I mean, that's something that we're trying to promote, uh, mindful drinking with the craft beers. Uh, because of the alcohol percentage to, you know, 6%, 7%. Some of them, um, they're surprised that they can only drink three or four uh, as compared to when they're drinking San Miguel Light or uh, San Miguel Pilsen. Actually, even me, I don't want to drink San Miguel uh, Light anymore because <laughs> I think I can finish a case of it. You know, the flavor is just <laughs> easy if you're used to flavorful beers and you're starting to drink something light. Oh, it's... Uh, yeah, you have to be careful. The same. Yeah. <laughs> I can easily, even hard seltzers, right? I can finish like a lot of it and just. It's a good, a great beach beer. You can drink <laughs> all day and not even notice that you've drank a whole case. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Put water in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, nice and cold. Well, Raul, you mentioned that, would you say that your focus now is on expanding a little bit now that we're, I guess we, I can ask a a little bit about the situation in Metro Manila in terms of COVID. Are things starting to really open up? Are individuals returning? Maybe is the, the tourism market opening up? Or is international business travel starting to resume again? What's the situation like? Yes, uh, so we're open now. Um, we opened our doors to tourists as well. And uh, a lot of it's traffic now in Manila. <laughs> so it's back. It's of, back. Traffic's it's, back. It's, it's, it's a lot of traffic. <laughs> exactly. So um, yeah, it's uh, busy, and uh, my team has been busy uh, doing uh, production. And the uh, next uh, step for us is to actually expand our production capacity. Uh, it can be bringing new equipments or maybe adding some, well, adding some equipments that can improve improve our efficiency uh, or looking for another location but we're not yet there uh, I think right now I want to make sure that I have a good supply of ingredients before I commit on expanding a bigger you know brewery I was at the CBC and uh, I see like this big tanks it's like oh man I want to I want to get one <laughs> but uh <laughs> but uh but I, I know that we still have a problem with the supply of ingredients um Right now, we have so many challenges, and I can mention some. Um, so we have, um, the Philippines is hot. Uh, we have a hot weather, and it's very humid. Uh, food spoils really quick. It has a strain on our glycol chiller. Equipments are, you know, pushing hard, and um, electricity is expensive as well. 
So we want to actually install a solar solar panels in the brewery, just to cut our electricity maybe twenty to twenty five percent by twenty five percent. And um, yeah, these things are not part of the brewing operations, but these are things that I think we have to fix first so that we can sustain. It's about maybe sustainability for now and uh, slowly expanding. Um, you can easily get excited with, hey, there's a demand and we have to add more capacity, but I don't want us to be running while we're not at ready. So um, I think uh, the next step is for us to fix those things. And I know you mentioned, so you mentioned expansion and now just, you know, we're obviously checking out you and your brewery and your website. So it's, you know, Elias Wicked Ales and Spirits. Is, are Spirits mainly referring to perhaps the seltzer side or is there something in the works for a little bit more of a harder type of alcohol? Yeah, so when I opened the, the brand, uh, I called it Elias Wicked Ales and Spirits because I was thinking I can do the spirits as well. I like spirits. I, I got into distilling as well. I think it's a, a normal transition for a brewer to be learning spirits as well. Mm -hmm. And um, But I noticed that it's hard to to start a distillery it's very challenging as well there's a lot of risk involved you can have methanol poisoning all those things and um, if you're a small brand uh, it will take a while for you to uh, be able to really pull a good that's just me that's what my observation is mm -hmm. uh, even you know barrel aging is taking years at least two years to call it a whiskey so i think uh, we're not yet there I just have the name there. Maybe someday we can, uh, you know, make our own. We did uh, some distillation during pandemic. We were able to release hand sanitizers, so, but that's okay, it. Cool. <laughs> yeah, we were able to, to use our distillation equipment. Uh, but uh, in terms of selling spirits, uh, we're not yet there. So we want to focus more on the, yeah, the ales. Yeah, fair enough. Hey, put it in, if it's in the brand, you you work up to it later, right? That's a uh, one checkbox to, to take care of right away. So that's fun. <laughs> be excited to see what you guys just sell. It's definitely like a very very big industry. You know, you have you have big craft beer, and obviously now there's there's a lot coming in the way of, of craft spirits, whether that's you know vodkas or gins or whiskeys or rums and things like that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, all a very, very interesting industry. And, and it's nice to see that craft has taken hold, not just on the beer market, but also on the spirits. And and yeah, hey, it'd be cool to see you guys uh, evolving. Yeah, I was thinking of that. If we have a bad batch, we can actually distill it. So <laughs> that's yeah, uh, that, that, that was the idea before. So it's good that uh, we don't have to use the distilling. <laughs> so that's yeah, a better so. way. Hey, waste not, <laughs> not. That's a good way of thinking Ex about it. Exactly. <laughs> Raul, you mentioned some additional expenses you said electricity is expensive and things spoil because of the hot um, humid weather because craft beer in a country like the philippines it, it's it's a new entity i see correct me if i'm wrong and you have such a market for macro beer that's culturally so profound across the country i know it's interesting because you look at a country like canada and the united states I said, I said this recently that craft beer is kind of in this weird area of being like, it's more expensive than, than your macro beer, but it's not so expensive to be out of reach for middle-class people, let's say. But I know like, for example, my wife, she's from South America and, and craft beer is a different, it's a different beast altogether. It's, it's still, it's, it's really expensive essentially. So you go to a craft brewery and and it's a lot of, the vibe is a little bit different. It's a lot more affluent people. It's a little less, it's a little less chill, if I can say that. It's just, <laughs> it's just a different clientele. Do you find that at, at LES? Do you find that the, the folks who would come to the brewery or would drink the beer, they would be folks who have some more disposable income or not necessarily? Uh, that's a good question, Andy. Uh, I, I'm... I remember when we opened, uh, the pricing was something that most people are not used to, right? So craft beer, just to give you an idea, let's say San Miguel uh, in a bar cost $1. And uh, when we opened our craft beers for $3. So it's like automatically times three and people are like, hey, they don't know what they're drinking. And uh, they're introduced to this $3, you know, for a pint. So um, 
what we did is when we improve our capacity, when we added more in our capacity, we were able to lower the cost. Uh, we were really want to penetrate that market, a general market. And um, also we released like uh, pictures uh, I know you won't be able to see this in U.S. In the U.S., you won't see pictures of craft beers being served, but uh, we we were able to to release something that, hey, maybe if I buy a picture, it's not too expensive because the price point is a bulk price point. So it's actually selling well now. Our pictures are something that uh, our guests are not like the A, B anymore. It can reach to C as well. So... Uh, people are enjoying it more and um, it, it's uh, because of the capacity with a little bit of uh, pricing that we have for, you know, the bigger servings. And I'm sorry, maybe you mentioned this, Raul, but you, you went over the process like the 36 months of, of getting distribution or having your beer available in certain locations. You mentioned shipping beer, whether that be technically legal or not. Um, you mentioned you, you guys do that. Is it outside of the brewery itself? Is it easy? Like, are you available in lots of shops or, or can, can I find LES beer in, in some supermarkets or convenience stores in Metro Manila or not so much? Yeah, not, uh, not yet, Andy. Uh, so the, we're still waiting for the product registration. Right. So the shipping of um, our kegs, uh, they're, they're legal because um, it's only when you have the cans and bottles you put, uh, if you put them in the grocery shelves, they have to be registered. Uh, the kegs is not one of them. So we can ship the kegs outside. Yeah, maybe because if the brand is already um, becoming public, uh, anyone can just grab it from the grocery, you know, then you really need to have a good uh, registration of the actual product. Uh, but if it goes to the bars and the bar owners are still selling them through tra- taps, uh, that's still okay. So Elia, so we are distributing to restaurants uh, on our kegs, but for cans and bottles, uh, we're still waiting for our, our license if we want them to be in grocery stores. Although we are selling them online already. So um, that's uh, because the facility is FDA approved. So I don't, I don't know how, how it works, uh, but we're okay. Even uh, just the FDA facility uh, certification. It's only that when we go to groceries, uh, they're looking for the product registration. Mm. And some other some other hotels they ask ask us about the product registration. So uh, until we get that, we won't be able to sell it. Maybe wow. some gray areas there. <laughs> Still. <laughs> yes, some some gray areas with yeah, lots okay. of things. <laughs> Let we, we navigate we navigate as best as we can. I guess well, Raúl. I'm interested in a, a little bit about, I guess, just a blunt question. Do you think the, the Philippines, like many countries across the world, out, Garrett and I, our country in particular, do you, do you think that the Philippines embraces American culture? Do you see that a lot, particularly in the big metropolis like Manila? Do you see maybe craft beer as part of this American culture that really is appreciated and liked in a place like Manila? Yes, I agree. Uh, we follow the U.S. very much. Uh, we we like watching basketball. You know, yes. that's our number one sports. I yes, you know so that. We, yeah, <laughs> we watch NBA. We follow them, and uh, we were colonized uh, uh, by Americans. Uh, right. So we had really good influence from them, and we follow their fashion, their movies, their life, lifestyle. And that's the reason why I believe that most people are getting into craft beers because uh, they're seeing all this big uh, trend in the U.S. and maybe in the in Europe too, but mostly in the U.S. That um, yeah, uh, craft beer is growing and um, they are interested to try it. Also, we have a lot of Filipinos uh, in the U.S., so especially in California. So every time um, a lot of Filipinos are going back home. Uh, every you know christmas for christmas vacation we noticed this during christmas we have a lot of new guests that are coming like filipinos uh working in the u.s and uh, bringing their families and letting them try hey this is a craft beer we have this in the u.s we want you to try it as well so we we see that a lot uh, during those months the, the connection between your two countries is goes back it's kind of like i mean it's part of the reason you 
the Philippines, you can speak English particularly well in, in <laughs> Manila. Right. Yeah, it's great. It's definitely convenient as a as a tourist. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I see that. Interesting. You said you lived in Singapore as well, I believe, for a little while. Did you find that obviously a big international city slash country, Singapore? Did you find that craft beer was particularly big there? Was that still kind of an emerging uh, industry or Singaporeans are already quite accustomed to craft beer? When I was there, there were a few local breweries. Uh, I tried some of them, but I got hooked uh, to trying the imported ones, the one from Belgium, the one from the US. And uh, I think that's where I really got my love in craft beers, to, to, to drinking craft beers. Right now, there's a, a lot. There are a lot of uh, craft breweries in Singapore. So we have this association. In, I think I mentioned a while ago, Southeast Asia Brew Conference, and uh, there are different representatives from uh, Southeast Asia. So Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam. That's why I know Asher Street as well. Yeah, it's it's really growing. I can see that trend. I think um, I don't know though, because in Singapore it's really expensive. The excise tax for alcohol, I heard, is really expensive. Everything, so everything in Singapore, is <laughs> everything really expensive. is expensive there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I remember drinking a beer there that cost like twelve dollars. Oh, twelve dollars. Mm-hmm. I remember traveling from Kuala Lumpur to Singapore, and it was like everything's now five times more expensive. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Are, are kind of similar, but everything costs way more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the craft beer in the Philippines, uh, so our price point is around three dollars, four dollars, and that's why some foreigners are like, oh, how, "How come your your craft beer here is so cheap?" It's like we cannot really price it that high because the locals cannot, you know, it's hard for them to afford it, and uh, yeah, maybe cheaper labor, uh, although the ingredients are imported, so it's very challenging. The margin is not as big as what you have in the US or in. Well, Raul, we're coming up on our hour mark and we want to be respectful of your time, of course. Maybe do you have any final words for us, any upcoming events or developments with Elias on the brewing side, on the spirit side, anything coming up that we should be aware of, anything you'd like our audience to know about Manila and the craft beer scene? The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to invite everyone to visit our brewery in uh, Manila. It's uh, Elias Wikipedia and Spirits. We're actually having our second tap room location. I mentioned a while ago, it will be in Bohol. So it's a one and a half hours flight uh, from Manila. Next time you'll be in Manila, Andy, you have to visit, uh, you know, <laughs> Definitely. Uh, this okay. uh, uh, other places. Uh, so in the Philippines, we're known for our beaches, really nice, beautiful beaches. And um, we're excited to be there. Uh, there's no craft beer yet in the island, and there are a lot of tourists. I was there three weeks ago, and everybody's drinking San Miguel, and it's like, I mm-hmm. want to open a, I cannot Gotta open a brewery. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm so, I'm so excited. It's like, oh, man, so many opportunities that uh, we, we, we don't want to miss. Uh, and I, I heard in Vietnam that uh, this is what the other breweries are doing. They're opening places on tourist destinations, uh, Da Nang, um, you know some some places which is so good uh, i think um we're following that trend as well in the philippines so we're excited and yeah um we have our hub cannon uh, uh for the brewing side we are excited to, to fire our hub cannon we want to do a lot of uh, you know dry hopping i think uh, bringing some some ingredients uh, from other suppliers will help us with the more on the quality side as well and some ease as well. So yeah, we're, we're just excited with the things that we're working on right now. And hopefully, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be ready for you know, uh, better, uh, more capacity, more, more beers to come uh, in the next few years. So. <laughs> like that. More beers to come. More beers to come. I like that. More beers to come. <laughs> Love it. Well, yeah. Raul Mazenke from Elias Wicked Ales and Spirits in Quezon City, just above the big, massive city of Manila in the Philippines. Raul, we really appreciate talking to you. I think Garrett and I learned a lot and uh, we definitely can't wait to visit and we'll be sure to let you know if uh, yeah if we make our way to Manila. We, we hope to. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. We hope. Uh, thank you for, for having me in your podcast.
really appreciate it. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks, Raul. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.